Good to see you all tonight. We are going to have a great time in Bible class, and I can't wait to see what God will do. As you guys are coming in, of course, we always ask you to uh, invite somebody to our Bible class. We always ask you to uh, share the stream with someone. I want you to be intentional about that today, sharing the screen and letting everyone know that we are in Bible class. And I want to make sure that each and every one of you have an opportunity to be a virtual evangelist. You ought to be sharing the word of God with someone every chance you get. So I want you to do that today. I'm asking you to do that as a personal favor to me as we, this is the very last night of our series that we've been on, I'm Not Okay. This is the very last night and uh, this one is a touchy subject. So I'm asking you to, uh, I guess, put your seatbelt on, brace yourself, as we're going to talk about some things and we're going to uncover and unlift some things that um, sometimes they're not dealt with in church and I believe they should be. So I'm asking you to prepare yourselves tonight. Of course, we're going to have a word of prayer. Uh, but just before I do that, I want to thank once again each and every one of you for all of your gifts. We adopted families this year and several families this year. And of course, you all have done such an amazing job at making sure that we have what's needed for all of those children. I received even uh, some information today, uh, some correspondence today of individuals who are asking, how do I give? How do I support? What can I purchase? Is it too late? And uh, so we're giving all of the gifts to the children on tomorrow and to their families on tomorrow. So at this point, the only thing that you can do is support financially and um, so we thank you for what you have already done. And if there's more that you would like to do, you can do that, but you would have to support financially at this point. Of course, you know, it takes time for Amazon and all of those places to deliver. So we're asking you to prayerfully consider those things. Now, we wanna go ahead and do our offering at the top of our Bible study tonight. So I'm asking each and every one of you to prayerfully consider what you will offer unto the Lord. Many of you, I'm so grateful to each and every one of you. Many of you tithe, not just on Sunday, but maybe you tithe on Wednesday. Maybe you tithe on Tuesday and all throughout the week. And whatever you need to do tonight, we ask that you would prepare your gifts to the Lord. What will I render unto the Lord? That's what you should ask yourself tonight as we prepare to give. Of course, those three ways to give are on your uh, screen at this time. Cash app, you can text to give. That number is 313. 367-0477, or you can go online. You can give at rlcdetroit.com or rlcdetroit.org. So we ask that you would do that at this time. God bless you. We're going to pray over our offering right now, and then we're going to pray that God would bless tonight's Bible study. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, because you are amazing, because you are awesome, because you are a God who never fails. We thank you, Lord, because you've been there with us, Father, through the trenches, through the trials, through every tribulation. You've been there with us, even as you promised in your word, Father, that you would never leave us and that you would never forsake us. And so, Father, we take this moment right now. We take this time right now just to give your name the praise to lift you up, to magnify you, Father, to extol you. Somebody needs a boost on this Wednesday, Father. Somebody is running on empty. Somebody is was just on the verge of giving up. But Father, I pray that as they tune in to this stream, God, that you would encourage them, that you would uplift them, that you would heal them right now in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, bless every gift and bless every giver. I pray, Father, that you would bless every tither. Father, I thank you for those who you have placed it on their hearts to be new tithers. Uh, I thank you, Lord, that you have given them the strength and the courage and the tenacity to trust you in the area of tithing. And so, Father, we thank you and we bless every new tither that has joined our ministry and, and has made a decision that they are going to trust you with the 10 percent that you have asked for. I pray, God, that you would do something special for them on this week. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Thank you, Lord, and amen. 
Amen. Amen. Again, uh, we thank you for tuning in and for joining us. And I want to know who is out here with us today as we prepare to begin our Bible study. Just tell us hello and uh, just uh, begin to uh, tell us where you are tuning in from. Maybe you're tuning in from out of Michigan or out of town. If you're in Detroit, just say West Side, East Side, Southfield, whatever. I want to know where you are tuning in from. Uh, because we love you and we appreciate you. And I want to hear those comments. I want to read those comments as we continue to worship the Lord today and journey through scripture. Tonight, this is our last installment of the series, I'm Not Okay. This is the last installment. And uh, this one is entitled, This Hurts. This one is entitled, This Hurts. Tonight, I want to talk to you because oftentimes I believe that our pain in church is underrepresented. I don't think we talk about it enough. I don't think we deal with it enough. Now we talk about it on the surface level. You know, we'll talk about it, we'll put it in a song, we'll sing the struggle is over, something like that and grace over it. But how often do we actually get down to the root of our issues, to the root of what hurts us and what pains us? Otherwise, how can we expect to heal? And so tonight we're going to talk about it. Uh, tonight's subject is this hurts. This hurts. Well, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. That question is, how do you describe your pain? When you express to, uh, to your friends and to other significant others, um, how do you describe that pain? And do you ever feel like they actually get it? When you say this hurts and when you say I'm feeling this way, do you feel like people actually understand you when you express yourself? You know, it's proven that most people don't know how to express their level of pain and therefore they never get the help or the support they need. You know, some people when they're expressing their pain levels, they'll say they'll just say ow, you know, and some people will scream. Some people maybe they'll even if it maybe you're the one who when you stub your toe you know, words might come out that probably should not be discussed in church. Maybe you're that person. What, how do you describe your pain? How does those who are connected to you and those who are around you, how do they know when you're hurting? And how do they know to what extent of your pain? How do they know the extent of your pain? How do they know? See, here's the thing, when you go to the doctor's office. You can't just say I'm in pain. The doctor needs to know exactly how much pain you're in before they pr prescribe to you uh, the dosage or the amount of medicine or medication that they would give to you. You can't just say I'm hurting and that's enough. There's nothing they can do with that because they will give you the wrong dosage and it won't help you at all. But when you go to the doctor, they actually give you the language so that you can properly allow them to gauge the level of your pain. So a doctor, maybe you've been to a doctor and you were in pain or after surgery, or maybe you broke a limb or something like that, a bone. And when you get to the doctor, they'll ask this question on a scale of one to 10, on a scale of one to 10, what's your pain level, 10 being the highest? They give you the language or the verbiage so that you can help them to figure out what's wrong with you. Because they understand if you just tell them simply that you're in pain, they could misdiagnose you. They could prescribe you something that you have no business having, right? And so I believe that there are so many people who have been in church who we knew they were in pain of some sort, we knew that something was going on, but because we did not properly give you the language or the verbiage to express yourself, many times we found ourselves where there were people who came to our services. There were people who were preached to and they were good sermons. There were people who, who sang and there were people who, who worshiped the Lord and you were in all of this uh, great, there was a great service. The worship was there. The anointing was there. But you left home after all of this great ministry. You left home still miserable. How is it that you could leave an anointed service with great preaching, great singing, great shouting, 
great worship and still go home miserable? Could it be that many of us came to these services, but we did not tell anyone exactly what we were going through? We did not tell anyone exactly how tough of a time we were having. We did not tell anyone how stressed out we really were. And so we didn't get the help we needed before we left. I need us to normalize being able to properly express when we're in pain. How many of our relationships have suffered simply because we lashed out, we screamed, we shouted, we, 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 we swung at somebody in some, some, some instances. We did all of these things, but we never took the time to simply say, I'm in pain. We never took the time to simply say, I'm hurting right now, and this is what my issue is. Many of us are in the problem, we are dealing with some of the problems that we're dealing with, all because we never knew how to normalize and verbalize being able to say, I'm in pain. And so this, this, this story is, is important to all of us because we started it, you know, I guess a week or two ago in Mark 14, where Jesus tells Peter, James, and John, I'm not okay. That's in Mark 14. And then uh, there's a part that I want to read to you today in Mark 14, verse 38. This is the New Living Translation. Mark 14, verse 38. You'll find these words, keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. The King James says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I want you to underline that in your Bibles. I want you to highlight it as best as you can for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is is weak. I want to do better. Everything in my soul says do the right thing. It says uh, follow the commandments, you know, of the Bible, the 10 commandments, follow all of the commandments. There's more than 10 in the Bible. Uh, the, I want to do what's right. My spirit is willing, but I'm struggling in my flesh. That's what I want to deal with for a moment, because many of us, we would do better if we had healed from the pain of our past. We would do better if we had healed in some of the areas that, that, that have taunted us and tortured us for many years. And so I want to try to marry this text. I want to try to marry this text. I want to try to marry this text with another scripture. That was Jesus's experience when he was not okay, when he was in pain. But I want to take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 7 through 10. This is Paul's experience with pain. I want to read that to you. It says this, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me, and keep me from becoming proud. Hear this, y'all. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Three different times I begged, I begged and pleaded with the Lord to take it away, this thorn that was in my flesh. And it says this, each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness. I want you to pay very special attention to that. So now Paul says, I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults and the hardships, persecution and troubles that I suffer for Christ. When I am weak, then I am strong. I want to kind of deal with that for a minute because Paul, when he deals with having a weak moment, when he deals with being weak, he says, after this crazy encounter that I have with Jesus, I realize that I shouldn't be boasting about the stuff that I do right. I should be boasting 
about my areas of weakness. That blew my mind because nothing about our culture, nothing about church culture says boast about your imperfections. Nothing about even in any secular culture in America says boast about your weaknesses. You don't get a job by putting on your resume your weaknesses. That's not how you get a job. If you put your weaknesses on a resume, nine times out of 10, that resume is going into the trash. But Paul says, I found out that I, I, I'm not giving God the glory when I boast about the things I'm good at. God gets the glory when I boast in the areas where I'm weak. This is completely countercultural. It's against everything that we've been trained to do. It's against everything that we know to do. But, but Paul says, I've learned because I've had an encounter with God that I can literally boast about the areas where I've not perfected. Why can I do that? Because I found out it was in my weakness that God proves his strength. It's in my weakness that God proves his strength in my life. The stuff that I'm good at, you'll just say, okay, you just have a natural gift to sing. You just have a natural gift to preach. You just have a natural gift to play the organ and the piano. You're naturally gifted with numbers, so you're an accountant. But what about the areas where you can say, I'm not good at that? So every time I do something in this area, you will know it didn't have nothing to do with James Johnson. That was all God. I need to ask somebody tonight, have you ever had an all God moment where you knew I'm not good in that area, I'm not, I have not perfected that area, but some way, somehow it worked out for my good and in my favor, in my favor. And I was able to perfect something that I was not good at. That was a God moment. And that's where I can boast that to say, listen, I was supposed to fail right here, but God, how many times have you been able to tell that testimony and say, listen, I was, I was messed up. I was horrible in this area. I was doomed to fail and then God showed up and he rose up in me in a way that I know it was nobody but him because if it was up to me, it wouldn't, I would not have done it. You see, let me use myself as an example. I'm, I'm gifted to preach, I'm gifted to teach, I'm gifted to sing, but pastoring has been different for me because the truth of the matter is, although I love ministry, ministry means meeting the needs of people. I'm not exactly a people person. I am horrible with small talk. I'm just not good at it. I can do I can do the best I can, but I'm just not good at small talk. I love people. I genuinely love people, but I'm an introvert. I say so. People think I'm not, but that's how I know it's nothing but God. When I can stand after a service and hug everybody, when the truth is, the, the, the real me wants to go and sit down somewhere and chill because I'm tired. That's when I know it's God. It's not fake. I truly love these people. But when God rises up in me and says, spread my love, that's when I know it's him. I know that I have uh, a short temper sometimes. So when people get on my very last nerve and I don't say what I really want to say, but he cuts my mouth and says, be quiet. Or he says, you know what? Don't tear them down. Build them up. That's when I know, oh, I know it was God because I planned, I went into that meeting ready to say some things that I probably should not have said. I went into the situation and I just knew I was going to say some things that was going to tear some folk up, but I didn't do it because God rose up in me. I need to know, is there anybody present tonight, anybody streaming tonight that can say, I got a whole lot of but God moments. I know it was God because he strengthened me in an area where I knew I was weak. Tonight, Paul shows us you can boast about your weaknesses because it's in your weak place that God shows up and he gets the glory by showing you it was never your strength that mattered. It was always his strength. And so Paul gives us some things that we need to look at tonight. He, he talks to us about a few things. He talks to us about a few things, but what I love is that Paul describes for us the level of his pain. That's kind of what I talked about kind of when I started this whole thing. Do you know how to properly gauge and express to other people your level of pain? Paul does that for us 
He doesn't give us a number scale, but he does something else. He uses imagery. Paul says, I had a thorn in my flesh. He, he uses imagery because it was not a literal thorn. It was not a literal thorn. It was something that was bothering him that he couldn't get away from. He couldn't get away from it and it bothered him. But he said it was like a thorn in my flesh. The first thing that I learned from this imagery that Paul gives us is this. When you look at a thorn, before I give you the point, let me express it to you this way. When you look at a thorn, oftentimes thorns are small. Oftentimes you can hold a thorn in your hand. It's, it's small. You, 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 you can look at a thorn, one particular thorn, and you can hold it in your hand. But, but, but get this. I want you to see something here. When you look at a thorn, yeah, it hurts, but it's small. One of the things that I learned about a thorn is this. Here's the first thing when we deal with pain. The smallest pains sometimes have the greatest impact. The smallest pains, it's, it's the little things that sometimes cause us the most trouble in our lives. Can, have you ever experienced that and noticed that it was something that was small to everybody else? And everybody else was trying to figure out why were you tripping? And why were you so upset? And why did it trigger you so bad? But sometimes it's the small thing. It's uh, almost the insignificant thing that causes you crazy pain. How many of us will be honest enough to say, I've had some big issues, some big traumatic experiences, and other people looked at it, and they didn't understand what I was going through because it looked real small. That's the first thing that I see here in this text is that sometimes it's the small things that we try to cover up. Sometimes it's the small things that we try to overlook. Sometimes it's the it was the small argument that you had with somebody. And now that argument has, has been stained in your brain, in your membrane. And so now it's caused an insecurity. And it all started with an argument that they forgot about. But because you never resolved it, it's now become a thorn, a small thing that's now, it now has great impact. How many of us have ever had to deal with the small things? Have you ever had a splinter? You ever had a splinter in your hand or in one of your fingers? It's real small. Sometimes you can barely see it, but it still hurts. Other people won't notice the splinter. They'll try to shake your hand because they don't notice it because it's real, real small. But you notice it even though it's small because it, it hurts. You notice it because it's an inconvenience to you. You notice it because when you have a splinter, it sensitizes the rest of that area on your hand. You end up having points or, or, or parts of your hand that you cannot touch. It's sensitive to touch all because of this one little itty bitty splinter. Paul says it was a small, thorn, but it was causing me a whole lot of pain. And I want to talk to somebody who has been frustrated with your life, because when you look at the thing that's causing you the pain, you're saying to yourself, this should not be this big. This should not have all of this impact. This thing should not have me crying anymore. This thing should not have so much uh, uh, so many insecurities in me. It should not have been able to cause that. Why am I so upset about this small thing? But I need you to understand that small things are significant too. Small issues become big issues when we ignore them. And that's why sometimes you got to kill it while it's small. That's why sometimes you got to handle it while it's small. That's why you got to pay attention while it's small so that it does not get any bigger. You see, a splinter starts off small, but if you don't get it out, it'll cause an infection. And that little splinter can cause big problems, so big that it could mess up your entire hand. 
You got to learn how to deal with the small stuff. That's the first thing that I want to do. But, but I also, I did some studying on thorns. Because, of course, when we look at a thorn, we see the negative. We see that it's inconvenient. We see that it hurts us. We see that it causes us to be sensitive to touch. We see all of that. We understand it. We realize that. But, but I also found out that biologically, thorns have purpose. Thorns have purpose. The first purpose is this. A, a thorn, what it does is it causes uh, animals or herbivores not to be able to touch the fruit uh, because they are afraid of the thorns. They, the thorns act as a deterrent for animals that would try to eat the berries from those trees or those bushes. The thorns have purpose. What if I told you your thorns have purpose? What if I told you your pain has purpose? That's point number two tonight. Your pain has purpose. What if I told you that there is a purpose for the thorns that you have in your life. I know I can't just tell you this hurts. This is not just going to be a time for us to complain about the areas where we're hurting. Yeah, we need to deal with them. We need to unpack them. We need to uncover them. But a lot of the healing process starts when you realize you had to go through it because it made you who you are today. Your thorns have purpose. A thorn is a deterrent to animals that are trying to eat fruit that does not belong to them. Sometimes the thorn, as inconvenient as it is, as hurtful as it is, it's the thorns that deterred people from being in your life that were never supposed to be there. Here's the question that I must ask you. When you look at your circle, when you look at your friends, when you look at your significant other, I must ask you this question. Can they handle your thorns? Can they handle the part of you that even you don't like? Can they handle the part of you that sometimes gets a little sticky? That's the question that I have for you. That should be on the screens. Can you handle my thorns? Can you handle my thorns? It's still not on the screens. Can you handle my thorns? I need friends that are not just in my life for the good that I can offer them. I need friends that are not just in my life because they have access to my bank account. I need friends that are not just in my life based upon the resources that I can provide to them. I need friends that can handle when I'm not okay. I need friends that can handle when I get upset or uptight. I need friends that can handle when I get a little frustrated from time to time. Can you handle my thorns? I need to ask you today as you pay attention to your circle, as you pay attention to those who are surrounding you, as you pay attention to the people that you talk to every day, are they only in your life when you got it all together? Or can, you, or, or can they handle you on your bad days? Can they handle you when you're not in the mood? Can they handle you when you slip up and do something you shouldn't do. Can you handle my imperfections? Can you handle, I need people that are willing to be in there for the long haul because there are some people that just can't handle your thorns. And here are some signs that maybe some of the relationships that did not work out in your life is simply a result of the fact that they could not handle your thorns. I'm just gonna give you a few signs, signs that people could not handle your thorns. Maybe that they left you, those friendships or relationships left you because they said friendships should not be this hard. They left you because they said, you know, a relationship should not have to be this hard. Have you ever heard that before? Who 
made up this rumor that relationships are not hard? Who told you that real valuable friendships are not hard? Do you know anything that is worth value at all? You got to work towards it. You got to work through that thing. You got to work out the kinks. You got to work out the things that you don't understand with each other. If you want an easy relationship, you're also saying, I want a cheap relationship. I want a relationship where I don't have to give nothing. I want a relationship where I don't have to do nothing. I want a relationship where I don't have to sacrifice at all. How many times have we said we want easy, but the truth is you don't want easy. You want something that you can say, I value this. I worked towards this. I worked on it. And now that I have it where I need it to be, I'm never going to let it go. I want somebody that values me enough to show me you're in the trenches with me. And so a sign that they can't handle your thorns could be if they left you because they said the relationship was just too hard. They weren't willing to do the work. They could not handle or work through your thorns. Or maybe there are people who judged you from afar. They never got a chance to know you, but they labeled you as difficult even though they didn't even know who you were. They labeled you as stuck up and sedity. They never got a chance to know you. They looked at you from afar and they saw your thorns and said, I can't even deal with that. They looked at you from afar and they saw your thorns and they said, I can't even mess with that. They didn't understand that the reason your thorns were there were not just as a bad thing, but to protect you from people who wanted access to your fruit, but they weren't willing to go through the work. They want access to your fruit. They want access to your money. They want access to your heart. They want access to your emotions, but they don't want to go through the thorns. Sometimes you got to be willing to go through the thorns if you want to get to the fruit. So, Paul, I'm just about done. Paul is in this thing and he says, I got this thorn in my flesh and it hurts. And it's hard for me to operate like I should because I got this thorn. I'm doing it, but... But, but it's different. I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing the best that I can. But this is tough for me because I got this thorn in my flesh. I need you to realize the thorns that you have in your life. I need you to realize some of those areas in your life where you can say, I thank God. I know that God is real. I know that he's present because I'm still operating. I'm still doing ministry. I'm still taking care of my family. I'm still going to work every day, but I would be lying if I didn't tell you the truth. I still have this thorn that every time I try to forget about it, I feel something pricking me. Something that is touching me in a way that I don't like. Something that is hurting me. I don't know what to do about this thorn. So he says, I went to God not one time, not twice, but the Bible says, KJV says, I besought the Lord thrice. I went to the Lord. I begged him three times. And God gave me the same answer all three times. And yet I was still stuck with a thorn. How do you process? Here's the question. How do you process the pain of an unanswered prayer? We're talking about things. That hurt. This this hurts. Can I tell you there is nothing more painful than praying and fasting and laying prostrate before the Lord. And it looks like he won't answer your prayer. How do I deal with the pain of me saying, Lord, I need you to deliver me from this. And he keeps giving you the same answer. And yet it seems like that answer is not the answer that we want. Can I suggest to you that God never leaves any prayer unanswered. We just take it as if it's unanswered because it's not the answer that we wanted. How many of us will be honest enough to say, God answered the prayer, it just wasn't the answer I was looking for. Paul said, I went to him the first time. I said, Lord, get, you got to take this thorn from me now. I'm, I'm an apostle. I'm, I'm saved. I got power. I'm praying for your people. I'm building churches all over the world. The least you could do is take this thorn from me so that I can keep working in ministry. 
And he said, Jesus answered and said, my grace is enough. My grace is sufficient. Paul didn't like that answer. So he went back to the Lord a second time. He went back. How many of us have ever, you know, we heard God clear the first time, but we didn't like what we heard. Have you ever, come on, be honest with me. Have you ever had to go back to God and say, uh, uh, let me ask you this again, because the first time you did not give me the answer I wanted. I'm talking to somebody that will be real today and say, listen, I have had some interesting conversations with God because I asked him for something and his answer was not the one I wanted. So Paul says, I went back to him a second time. I went back and he gave me the same answer I got the first time. All right, Paul, you say you got a, you have a relationship with God. You got your confirmation. You went back. You ought to be able to just deal with it, right? Paul said, no, because it's not the answer I wanted. So I just to make sure, you know, the third time is a charm. I went back a third time. I went back a third time and I said, Lord, take this from me. He begged. The Bible says he begged. It was not a pretty prayer, y'all. It was one of those snot crying prayers. It was one of those prayers, the ugly face cry. It, he did his best to say, Lord, do whatever you can, but please take this thorn from me. It hurts. I'm doing ministry, but I'm hurt. I'm leading while I'm bleeding. I'm hurt and you have given me this anointing that calls for me to pray for other people and I'm seeing their prayers being answered right before my face and yet I asked you for one thing and you won't give it to me. This hurts. I'm talking to somebody that can say my, my, my pain is bigger than just somebody lied on me. My pain is bigger than just, you know, I didn't get what I wanted, but, but, but what do I do when God has anointed me and I'm praying and I'm seeing the manifestation of other people's prayers everywhere else, but God, this one prayer I'm asking you for, and you keep telling me the same thing. I'm hurt. How do I walk with this storm? How do I preach? with this storm? How do I heal the sick with this storm? How do you expect me to raise a healthy, non-toxic family with this storm? How am I supposed to maintain a marriage with this storm? You expect me to be vulnerable to other people? When I got this storm, it almost doesn't make sense. And God answers the same request with the same answer every single time. My grace is enough. You see, for many of us, the reason that we've been stuck in the place that we're in, and I've, I've been taking my time because I want to make sure we get this word today. The reason that we've been stuck in the place that we're in is because we were expecting God to move the way that we wanted him to move. We serve a sovereign God. He does what he wants, when he wants, and the way he wants. In other words, you thought, God, I can do ministry. I just can't do it with a thorn. But God said, no, 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 that's not how my grace works. I can show you how strong I am in your weakness. Keep the thorn, and guess what? I got some grace to cover that thorn. And I'm talking to somebody in here today that can say, listen, I know you thought that you, we, we, we've been coming to church and people have been telling us that you can pray everything away, that you can fast everything away and that you can, you can pray, you can fast and you're going to get this miracle and some things you won't have to deal with. But I'm here to tell you that a mature believer understands some things you can't pray away, some things you cannot decree away. Some things God says, you're going to have to take this grace and listen, even if I won't take you out of it, I'll give you grace so that you can win while you're in it. And I want to tell somebody in here today, I don't know who you are, but I'm here to tell you this word was just for you. I can't tell you God's going to take you out of it. 
I'm telling you, you are about to win while you're in the struggle. You are about to win while you're in the trial. You are about to win while the circumstance is still, it's still hot. It's still current. It's still going on right now. But I wish somebody would just say, I'm going to win while I'm in it. If he's not going to bring me out of it, then I'm going to get the glory. God's going to get the glory while I'm in it. And I'm going to get the victory. God, you get the glory. Just give me the victory. I'm going to win while I'm in it. The victory belongs to Jesus. I pray that somebody was encouraged tonight. I don't know what your pain is. I don't know what your thorn is. I don't know what your inconvenience is. I don't know what's hurting you, but what I do know is you can win while you're in it. God has given you the grace to beat it while you're in it. You are more than a conqueror because he loves you. You are not just a conqueror, but you are more than a conqueror. God is giving you the grace to win it while you're in it. I want you to take that. I want you to write it down in your notes. I want you to just comment. I'm going to win it while I'm in it. I'm going to win it while I'm in it. You got to have the faith to decree a thing and watch it comes to pass. If I can't pray myself out of it, then I'm going to win while I'm in it. While I'm in the struggle, I declare victory over every person that is streaming today. Victory in your marriage. I know it looks like it's about to fail. I know it looks like you're on the verge of, uh, you look like you're on your way out of that thing. But I'm here to tell you, God has put a grace on your marriage and you can win it while you're in it. I know your children are acting crazy and your entire family dynamic looks like it's going crazy. But can I tell you? You can win it while you're in it. Your children will be saved. Your children will be healed. Your marriage will be saved. It will be preserved. God can do it. That job, you were on, your ver you were on the verge of quitting. You were on the verge. You were on your way. Somebody I'm talking to today, you have already wrote the resignation letter. I'm talking to you, directly to you. You already wrote the letter. You just waiting to hit sin. I'm telling you right now, don't do it. God says you can win it while you're in it. Before you know it, you're going to see a change. And the people who were trying to push you out are going to have to promote you. I'm speaking prophetically to somebody. And y'all know I don't do this often. I'm speaking prophetically to somebody who was just about to quit your job. You already wrote the letter. I'm talking to that individual. You already wrote the letter and you were about to send it. And God says to you today, stop. I have grace. I have graced you with the ability to win while you're in it. I pray that you guys were able to enjoy this message. I hope you got something out of it. Um, I'm just kind of burn. I'm burning in my soul. So I'm going to close my iPad so I can quit and kind of keep us at a, a good, decent time. But I want you to know to every person who has had any type of pain, you've been the one that has been able to say this hurts. I want you to normalize being able to say it. And I want you to normalize being able to focus on that pain until you find the purpose of that pain. Don't let the pain kill you. There's purpose in that pain. God can use even the thing that hurts you. And before it's all over, it's going to work out for your good. I hope you receive that word tonight. God bless you and God keep you. I'm so glad I didn't preach this on a Sunday because I'd be running around this sanctuary. I'm trying to sit still. I hope you feel what I feel tonight, that you can win it while you're in it. God bless you. There may be someone today who wants to accept Jesus Christ. You need this grace that we've been talking about, a grace that allows you to win it while you're in it. I'm going to keep saying it till I can't say it no more. Uh, you need that grace. You need access to that grace. You need to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior. And so I'm going to walk you through that process. We're going to repent which means we're going to apologize to God and do our very best to turn away from the very things that are displeasing to the Lord. God's not asking you to be perfect. He's asking you to try. 
He's asking you to try to do better. Salvation is a process. Every day is better than the last. If you put your trust and your hope in him. So repeat after me, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me for all of my sin. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe you died. I believe you rose again on the third day. And I believe you live even today. So, Lord, I welcome you into my heart. Change me. Make me a better person. From this day forth, I am saved. If you prayed that prayer, then my brother, my sister, you are saved. And we welcome you into the body of Christ. We are so glad and elated that you were able to make that decision today that you are going to follow Jesus. I'm telling you, it's the best decision of your life. And it's going to it's going to get even better from here. This is just the beginning for you. Now, there may be someone who joined our stream just a little late. We did the offering at the beginning, but I want to make sure that every person has an opportunity to uh, bless the Lord in your tithes and in your offering. We are a tithing church. If you're not tithing yet, then I'm believing God for you that you are fixing your budget so that you can make sure that you can tithe, pay all of your bills and save. Listen, just because you are a tither does not mean that you should be lacking at home. That is not the plan or the desire of God. But tithing is a spiritual discipline. If you can budget to tithe, you can budget to save. You can budget to invest. You can budget so that you can live a better life. That is the design and the desire. And 10% of what you have earned belongs to the Lord for the upbuilding of his kingdom so that we can continue to get the word out everywhere. So I'm asking you to uh, present that offering, that tithe to the Lord today. Those three ways to give are on the screens, cash app, dollar sign, RLC movement, text to give, 313-367-0477, or you can go to our website, uh, rlcdetroit.com or rlcdetroit.org. I love each and every one of you, and uh, on tomorrow, I'm taking those gifts to the families, and so I'm excited about that. I have a few more gifts to buy. Uh, we're going to go and purchase them tonight and um, then we'll have them all set. I want you to know God is so good. He's so gracious and it feels good to be a giver. Excuse me. That is what our church is about. We are givers. And so I thank you guys for everything that you have given towards these families that we're adopting for the holiday. They were foster families that we were able to connect and partner with uh, Wayne County, DHHS, Wayne County. And we were able to do some great work. And so I thank you. We could not have done it without you, without your contributions, without you being a tither and a giver, without you giving something a little extra during this holiday season to show them that they are loved and that we all serve the same God. And he is good to each and every one of us. So I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you, that his face would shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace now henceforth and forevermore. We said amen. You are dismissed and I'll see you on Sunday. God bless you.